and welcome again to another episode of Mid American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener intern, Tanisha Shade Spain. This week we're going to answer some of your questions that were sent in by you, our viewers, and we're going to cover other topics and show and tells brought in by our fabulous panelists. So let's just jump right in and have each of our panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit more about their specialty. So John, we'll start with you. Okay, I'm John Bodensteiner. I'm a Vermaine County Master Gardener and I kind of like uh, hostas. I, I have a lot of shade in my yard now. I used to have a lot of sun, but I've got a lot of trees now. Uh, I, I Pretty much there's not too much I don't like. I, I like growing tomatoes and um, just about any perennial, annual, whatever. Whatever. Okay, next. Uh, I'm Ella Maxwell and I'm a horticulturist and a master gardener and a certified arborist and I can answer most of your questions on trees or shrubs. Uh, I do have a lot of perennials as well and um, I'm happy to be here. Wonderful. And Jim? And I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired horticulturist and plant pathologist with the University of Illinois Extension. <coughs> And like I say, I am retired and enjoying it. <laughs> <laughs> Make no mistake about that, right? right. Okay, so we've got uh, a lot of show and tells to get to tonight. John, we're going to start with you. Okay. What do you got? I have a Japanese umbrella pine tree. The first part of that, it is in the pine. <laughs> it's a genus all basically onto itself, Skyadopidus verticillata. And it's one of those prehistoric trees. Uh, it, um, it dates back to the time of ginkgos and Jim was telling me something that ginkgos were native here. They died out and then now we had to bring them back from China I believe. Right. And um, this uh, can grow to 30 to, to 50 feet. It um, likes acidic soil. Um, I just thought you know it's it's just so different. Kind of like I, I have a ginkgo in my yard so I said well I've got to have this just to to uh, go along with the uh, uh, with the ginkgo, and it's slow growth for the first ten years. Uh, after that, it tends to take off, and you need to protect it from the winter winds. It does, you know. I might spray it with some uh, um, sprays, uh -huh. wilt proof, wilt proof, and something like that. Um, but. Um, I just thought it was very interesting and I couldn't pass it up. So, so just after their 10 years of slow uh, growth, do they go up or yes, out? Yes, both. both uh, okay. 30 to 50 feet up. Wow, that's no small tree. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll, it, you know, I'm, I, you know, after 10 years, at which I'm hoping I'm still around to see that it start to really take off and I'd love to see it 50 foot tall sometime. You always wonder when you're planting those, you know, with positioning, where mm -hmm. are you going to put it, which, you know, is it going to fill out or be really tall? So that's why I always try to ask that. I've got a question. You said you have a lot of shade. Is that a shade a lot taller No, plant? this is this is not. I, I do have a sunny spot for oh, it, though. Okay. Uh, it, is, it is going in a sunny spot. So I have one small, uh, it's probably a couple hundred feet by a hundred feet of, uh, of sun. The rest of the three acres is all shade. Gotcha. You fly okay. over and you don't see anything. <laughs> you, you go to Sky Watch or Sky whatever that is, uh -huh. and you don't see anything except for the driveway and this one little <laughs> That one <laughs> little patch. <laughs> well, look for that tree if you fly over. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, Ella, what do you have? Um, well, I have some viewer questions here, okay. and this was a weed that she thought was purslane, so I did bring purslane. Uh, this was Barbara, and um, she wanted to know whether it was edible or not, and that's the thing about weeds is many of them are edible, and that's how we got them and uh, this is purslane it can be uh, stir-fried or sauteed uh, you can also uh, uh, rinse it and of course you'd put it through like a salad spinner and then it could be chopped and you can use it fresh um, it's kind <laughs> she of bland on some. tasting mm -hmm. and so you might you know if you want a nice vinaigrette or uh, maybe some cheese with it or dried cranberries or you know whatever but uh, uh, if you didn't want it it is easily removed it's very shallow rooted but uh, many of the weeds were used and actually brought to North America and I had another question about someone who wanted to identify um, mullen and this is the common mullen 
Verbascum uh, thapsis, and it's a biennial. So it completes its life cycle in two years, and the first year, it's just this basal rosette, and I apologize that it's wilted, but um, it was used for like earaches and such, and they wanted to know whether it was native. Well, it's all over the United States pretty much, but it is not native. It's actually uh, native of Pakistan, but uh, again, moved across Europe and the European ancestors brought that with them. So it's, it's lots of good things you can do with weeds. Now, I have a question. You eat some leaves. What do you eat on the purslane? Do you also eat the stem? Yes, you can eat the stem as well. Um, uh, it's kind of um, mucilage. What, what, what kind of taste would that be? You know, it's kind of slimy, Ooh, actually. Okay. Yeah. Maybe it's, you don't want that one in your okra. salad. Okra. It's, it's okra like. Okra -like. Yeah. Okay. So right. there and, we go. And your okra raw is pretty good in a salad, but you only want to cut it right when you're mm -hmm. going to eat the salad, not a half hour before, because again, you get that mucilage. Mm -hmm. that, right, uh, right. And and uh, I like grilled okra, so maybe we should throw this on the barbie. <laughs> See, and you never pickled, know. Pickled is pickled. Uh, Ooh. Uh, we All have right. to try this pickled. There. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this guy's always in the kitchen. Okay, Jim, we're going to move to okay. you. I have yellow belly snapsucker, and yellow belly snapsucker is a migratory bird, and it makes holes in your trees that are kind of squarish looking, especially as they dry out. And if they make enough holes like they did in the birch, it'll kill it. And if you will hold up that one, sure. they also do it to the evergreen. And they really, uh, some of the evergreen can lead to death uh, with, just like the birch. This migratory bird is flying through spring and fall. And uh, these in our area at dawn and dusk, but it's going to go up to Wisconsin if you want to hold up Absolutely. the map. Absolutely. It's going to go up to this area for the summer, and it's in the south for the winter. But in Illinois, we get the spring and fall one. The other thing about this, it remembers the tree it fed on. Hmm. So if it got fed on in the spring, it's going to hit it again in the fall until that tree dies. But there is a control for it. Now, the bird is protected by state, federal, and, and international law because it's a migratory bird, but you are allowed to scare the heck out of it, <laughs> and that is by bringing in your pet snake, <laughs> five foot long, okay? <laughs> now, it's a migratory bird, so you don't have to move it. Just tie it in the tree where you're getting the damage the, from the first time so you don't come back. If they see the snake, they'll fly in and fly right back out without feeding on the tree. Now, if you're looking at a bird who is staying around here, like maybe some of the other woodpeckers, because the yellow belly sapsucker is the woodpecker whose primary food is sap. But other birds, like, or maybe they got blueberries or something like that, if to keep them away from those plants, you have to move it daily so they think this guy is really alive. That's a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> but I did it on blueberries once for a whole summer, and I got blueberries and for it the worked, first huh? time. Now, where do you get one of those? Uh, you can buy these sometimes in the garden center, but I got all mine. I got three of these uh, mail order catalogs. Okay, so look. And now you can probably also find them on the web. Gotcha. They had to warn me right before I came in <laughs> that he was going to have this here because I am very afraid of snakes, and I'm so glad otherwise I may have said some bad words on television. <laughs> okay, we're going to go to some calls now. We've got Tom Indicator, and he has a question about little white gnats. Tom, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Go ahead. Okay, I have a, my uh, daughter got uh, a birthday present from my uh, from my wife about like five years ago, and it's a, it was one of those orchid plants like they sell in the uh, outer Kroger's or whatever. The thing has done beautiful for years and years, but it seemed like this year it died, so I kept looking around to find out what was wrong with the soil and the mulch and everything. And it's, it's loaded with those little teeny-weeny white, they're like white gnats. Oops. They're about the size of a, like a, a pencil pen. Like How white. do I get rid of these? Out of white the, uh, fly? Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're it's little a, it's kitty, teeny, weeny bugs. Do they <laughs> fly? I don't think so. They're busy in the mulch. But mm. now the top of the orchid part, uh, it's been living for five years. But this year, the whole top part, is it's died out. 
but the bottom leaves are about like eight to nine inches long, and they're still doing perfect. Well, if we, being it's an orchid, it's not going to have, you know, they, they have very different root systems and usually have it in bark or something. What I would do is take it out of the pot and just rinse off everything, get rid of the, the bark that you have in there, wash it off, maybe even use a little bit of insecticidal soap and then rinse that off and then repot it. I and think that should... that's the, be the best thing too, don't you, Jim? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. We have a consensus from the group. Okay. Steven. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead. Don't leave, make sure you get the soap off the plant because you don't yeah. want to leave any residue. Yeah, yeah, that's right. You rinse it off. Very good. Okay. Okay. I thought we were going to go to the phones, but we're going to go to another round of questions. So, John, we're going to go oh. with you. Okay. We have always grown healthy cauliflower, but this year it's not doing well. The heads are not forming and the leaves are withered. Do you have any suggestions for next year? Could be a number of things. We had a very different spring. It could have been, you know, it was hot and dry, then it was uh, wet and hot, and uh, it, it sounded like possibly cabbage yellows or fusarium soil fungus. Um, that's spread by leaf hoppers, and uh, what you need to do is rotate it. Um, don't overwater it. Um, don't, I mean, don't spray it like this. Uh, use a, a soaker hose. Uh, there's a, a variety that is a little bit more resistant. It's called early snowball. Um, it likes a pH of about 7.2. So if you have a healthy plant, a healthy plant likes the right soil. If diseases like unhealthy plants or unhappy plants, disease and insects will usually attack a plant that is not healthy and able to fight off the disease or the insect. I found out that fall planted cauliflower actually is more flavorful and it likes the cool weather too. So mm -hmm. um, I would I would say next year make sure that you rotate it. Don't plant it where you had where you had it. Um, there's there's other diseases, but I think that was probably the one that probably was was your biggest bugaboo this year. Okay. All right, Ella, we're gonna go to you. We have another plant ID question. Kathy says, help. What is this perennial plant? It blooms late May to early June. Right, and uh, I did identify it from the picture that we had, and it's a Lysimachia. It's called garden loose strife or um, circle plant. Circle plant because the flowers are yellow and they go all the way around the stem. But you can see here at the base that it does spread. So here's mm -hmm. one stem. Next year, this is going to have uh, four stems. So it does spread. And uh, another Lysimachia that you do need to be careful of is the purple loose strife, mm -hmm. which is an exotic invasive uh, perennial plant that is very detrimental to a wetland habitat. But this one is uh, native and uh, yellow flowered and a good, a good plant to, to have. And you can just go over and get a little bit just pull out a piece from your neighbor's yard. <laughs> and it doesn't spread. <laughs> it doesn't spread badly. I had, you know, a, a, a three-inch pot, and now I probably, after five years, it's probably, oh, 24 inches. Okay. So it's and it's it's it is a, a striking yellow, mm -hmm. beautiful plant. The photo right, was me. beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Wonderful. All right, Jim. Uh, you've got another show and tell. Yeah, I have what they call shelf fungi. There's two groups of them, those that are really soft, like this one, it broke off because they are so soft. And then we have the hard one. Oh, wow. Like wood. That, that yeah, is. And they're called conks. And they actually produce growth rings. You can count how long it's been growing on the tree. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve years on this one. I have one that's about this big around mm. and it is only <coughs> five years old uh, because it depends on the wood rot that is killing the, or eating the tree out as to how fast they re reproduce mm -hmm. and destroy the tree. But, and some people like to eat these. Um, and I got a question early in the season about eating mushrooms in the turf. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if everybody saw that, but about a month later they were talking about the mushroom that everybody was wanting to eat was causing diarrhea, vomiting, mm -hmm. and even death. 
Yikes. So, <laughs> you don't want to eat mushrooms, toadstools, shelf fungi, unless you really, really know that they're safe or you like playing Russian roulette with your life. <laughs> oh, just let them rot the tree, and if it gets to be a problem, you get rid of the tree and start over. Now you've got me nervous for Morel's <laughs> next spring. Well, well you want to make sure you, there, there are things that look yes, like Morel's I that saw will that. kill you. No, you got to be careful. And the, the fairy rings right now have been, I've never seen as many fairy rings as I have this year. And those almost all, almost all of those are very poisonous. So even to touch, if you would touch them and get the kids the spores. Or the, and watch out for your pets that they're not going out and, and eating, you know, like a lot of the dogs mm -hmm. will go chew on something. Mm -hmm. If you see those, just don't knock them over, wear some rubber gloves, pick them up, put them in a bag and dispose of them because yeah. they can, you know, if you have pets, they can be very dangerous for your pets. Mm -hmm. Okay, no eating mushrooms that you well, find Well, I do have a giant <laughs> puffball one, and oh. if you, those, it's, it's, it's about, mm -hmm. you know, uh, volleyball size, and if you oh, cut wow. it and it's solid white, uh, you could eat those, yeah. but... Once they turn yellow, they're, they're not right. good anymore. That's but, but who wants yeah. to try? I mean, yeah. I'd rather just buy mine at the <laughs> store. Well, you know, I, or get mine on pizza. When there you I go. When I was in grad school, I had a professor teaching how to uh, identify fungi. And he said, the only way you can do it properly is to do a spore pattern. By the time you get done with a spore pattern, they're no longer fit to eat. Uh, he says, and maybe before that spore pattern, then this Russian roulette, so. Yikes. Yeah. Okay, all right, Stephen and Muhammad have a question about wireweed. Are you there, Stephen? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, absolutely, mm -hmm. go ahead with your question. Hey, uh, well, I got wireweed that's growing up in my, uh, the rock driveway in my unattached garage. I'm getting tired of messing with it. I know I know if this wet ground's wet enough, you can pull them up and they got they've got quite a tap root on them. If you don't, you aren't gonna, and I'm down in the back and I can't pull all of them up. So uh I'm not real real hot on spraying them with round up the or whatever it is. Uh, it only lasts for so long. I know you can put hot water, boiling water on some weeds and croak them and how about a propane torch to them? Does it does it when you when you pull it does and it breaks? Does it have a milky? Is it kind of milky on the on the, uh, where it breaks? I haven't paid all that much attention to it. It's, it's okay. usually got it's got a little skinny. Little you 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 can burn it, yeah. um, but I think a weed whacker is probably safer to use. Yeah. I yeah, mean to wait a minute to cut them. Yeah, but yeah. The part I told you was, it's on a rock drive, and I don't know how many times you use oh. it. <laughs> that I, might I be have, a little dicey. I have done it on gravel before because we have it at the nursery. I mean, you can't cut it right to the ground, but you can cut it off. I, I suppose you could try burning it. If it's an annual weed, what, what I you know that's safe uh, is vinegar. I mean, it, as long as it's in the driveway, it's not going to change the pH. It doesn't matter if it changes the pH a little bit there. Uh, vinegar, if it's an annual weed, will kill will kill it pretty good, and it's pretty safe. And and you could try and get, a pre emergent the concentrated, yeah. herbicide that wouldn't be Roundup, that would be a granular that you could apply over the driveway, and that would work for, you know, two months. And the sooner you get it, because each one of those, I forget how many thousands of seed each one, they can get to be about like that, and thousands and thousands of seeds, and every one of those will, depending on where they land is gonna come up at a different time and blow and mm -hmm. and so the sooner you can get that, you, you, and they're more vulnerable when they're small too. Okay, all right, good advice. We're gonna to go to four now, Pat in Rantoul, suckers on tree roots. Pat, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi. Uh, we removed two Bradford trees in the bermed area uh, two years ago and had the stumps all ground out, but we continue to get these suckers that keep coming up and I keep either pulling them or spraying them with Roundup and they continue to come. Is there any way I can really get rid of them? Now there are hostas and some perennials around them also. Oh. You got a problem. Yeah. Uh, if Roundup is not killing them, it's because the roots are so long you're not getting enough Roundup on the shoots to spread out and take out the entire root system. So the other option is you got to dig up all those roots, or at least the fat one. You won't have to maybe do the one that's pencil size and smaller, 
But if you're looking at roots about this size or bigger, they're going to have enough nutrients to set up suckers on you. And so you're going to have to dig them up and or learn to live with the new shoots. Or have well, a, the, uh, Jim, there are a couple specialty herbicides that you can use that are maybe more effective. Well, yes, yeah, the stump ring, uh, uh, it's a, tor a Tordon yeah. Yeah. Is, a, is a specialty herbicide. It's a cut brush killer right. and you would just cut the, off the, the sucker. The re reason I wasn't bringing that up was because it's in the roots are in among other, other plants, plants and I didn't uh, want to nail right. them. Uh, again, it, you want to use it judiciously but you could use that and it would work probably better and I have used that in areas. Now I have also used it and used too much of it and got some crinkly stuff so you have to be very careful. Okay. All right, so, if you decide oh. to go with the brush killer, paint it on with a small paintbrush. Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> that minimizes overdoing it. A little, a little foam brush, it. right? Yeah, a little okay. foam so you brush. minimize dab. overdoing it. Just a dab will do you. Got it. Okay, Susan and Muhammad. She has a question about transplanting. Susan, are you there? Yes, we are moving, and we are moving to Muhammad, and I have a beautiful garden way, uh, where we are moving. From, and I was wondering about the transplanting of our flowers. I don't know when is the best time to do the transplanting. Uh, is it too early to do certain ones? When is the best time, for instance, to uh, dig up my tulips and alliums? Is it too early to oh, pick them up and put them digging, right back down in the ground? You're digging up tulips and alliums? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're dormant right now. Yeah. You could do it, don't you think? Yeah, as long as you know where they are. That's, yeah. That's, that and, would be this, the, and this way you plant tulips anyway yeah. for the next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, you could dig them up now because they're, like Ella said, they're, there's no leaves on it, so they're not going to wilt. They're, they're dormant right now. And, and then plant them wherever, whenever, once you get moved. Keep them in the refrigerator until you're going to, um, in a cool, dry place at least. And, uh, and then plant them this fall yet. Okay. So she called right on time. All right, last call, CJ in Urbana. Or CJ, are you there? Hello, CJ? Hi, I was calling about canna bulbs. When is the best time to dig them up and, and what's the best way to store them? I don't have a basement. Um, I have an attached garage, but how, how do you best store those? Is that a heated them? garage? It's um, semi-heated. Okay, as long as it doesn't freeze. Right. You know, if it freezes, you can't put them out. You have to keep them so they don't freeze. I like put them just in uh, peat moss or or um, sawdust or something like that. That just keeps them uh, fairly, uh, gives them some support in case you get a bad one in there. If you if the the bad one is touching a good one, they're all going to rot. Mm -hmm. They're going to slowly rot. But I what I like to do is dig them up the day after you get your first frost. Right, I and, agree. And, uh, and then once it, you know, uh, you know, <clears throat> it usually have a nice sunny day sometime, and then that's when I lay them out in the driveway, let them dry, knock off as much soil as I can. I don't wash them, just knock off as much soil, and then put them in my peat moss and or yeah, sawdust. Yeah, I, I store them in a, in a paper, in a cardboard box, at, like a one or two layer high at the most. Again, don't wash them, but I don't put mine out in full sun. If I'm gonna let mine kind of cure, I'm gonna do it in the garage before I bring them into the house. But you wanna make sure they're dry. And you mentioned you had no basement. Do you happen to have a crawl space? No, no oh, crawl space. Okay, you're on a slab, okay. So if you had a crawl yeah. space, that's another option too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a cool, just a, a cool dark a, place. A closet that you, if you have any room in your closets <laughs> <laughs> for bulbs. Okay, Ella, you do you have another show and tell? I item? do. I do Let's have try to another fit that show in. and We've tell. Got a couple minutes left. Our um, our last one was Annette, and she has this red Chinese evergreen, and uh, we have a picture of it. And unfortunately, hers. And mine look alike. It's pretty <laughs> scraggly. So um, the idea is that she wanted to know what can she do once it gets tall and leggy. And so I brought a pair of pruners here, and I have already cut mine once. And we can see uh, right here where it was cut. 
and a new shoot is coming. So in her picture, she has three main stems. So we were going to really take one and cut it off near the base. So she's only going to remove one third of this and once a new shoot begins to grow, she can remove another third and then um, at the end she can cut the last leggy one off, but you don't want to cut it all at once. Give it some time. Yeah. And can yeah. you replant those? Um, you know, I don't believe that they'll root in water, but I think you could use a rooting powder yeah. and, mm -hmm. you know. I think, I think you can. Well, try uh, rooting yeah. them. Uh, I have uh, changed the water daily so you keep an oxygen supply in the mm -hmm. water. Most people, they put it in the water and they wait a week and that screws mm -hmm. it up. So change the water daily. And, and I also found out that coleus root real well in paper cups. If I put it in glass or, or whatever, but paper cups is good. Great. Okay. Thank you guys so much for all of your knowledge and, and information you gave today. And also, you can hear more gardening tips on our Mid-American Gardener podcast. Our podcast host, Victoria Shepard, goes in-depth with our experts on a variety of topics. Her latest episode is available now with Dr. Andrew Miller, talking about the most common spore-producing organisms that can be found in central Illinois gardens. That's fungus, in case you're wondering. Be sure to listen to find out more, but let's uh, get back to our panelists and... Well, I guess we don't really have enough time for any other questions. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. So thanks for watching tonight, and we will see you next week. And don't forget about all the fabulous ways that you can stay in touch with us and send us your questions via email, find us on Facebook, and on Instagram. Good night. <laughs>